I am basing my talk now partly on what I wrote uh, four years ago in a blog for Winter Tour uh, Photo Museum, but since then many things actually changed, and so I will maybe move towards those changes, those changes that are happening now. Uh, the issue of photography in the field of contemporary art seems very simple, actually, and, and there is no problem. Photography is a medium everybody is using now, uh, and of course, every artist is also using in one or another form. Every artist is using photography as research material, sometimes as medium to use himself or herself, or to commission something to, uh, to a professional photographer technical photographer, or to take some ready-made or found photographs. This is something everybody is doing, and it seems there is no problem with that. It's just one of the mediums, and in that sense, it's actually very, very common. And at uh, many exhibitions in one or another form, we immediately see photographs. And on top of that, photography is, of course, also used to reproduce artworks. This is something we also tend to forget that in as long as we are not traveling absolutely everywhere, actually 99% of the artworks we see in a reproduction online or in the pages of a magazine. Uh, and we kind of even tend to forget about it. We develop some sort of a media blindness, actually, that we are looking at something and saying, OK, this is an installation. But this is actually not an installation. This is a photograph of an installation that affects many things. Uh, so in that sense, this non-handmade, yeah, so to speak, uh, static medium is uh, everywhere. Still, um, when I was writing this blog, I was still teaching also. I was teaching right now, not anymore, but I was teaching for many years, almost 10 years, in a school in Moscow where young photographers and also young artists were studying together. And for many of them, it was a very practical issue from the very beginning. Uh, what they are doing and how to distinguish their fields. Uh, uh, and I would say that for young artists, contemporary artists, it was less a problem. They, from the very beginning, they understood that they can learn something about photo technique and use it in one or another form in their work. And those who consider themselves young photographers were a bit lost. And uh, the result of it was like, like at least half of them during the time of our the studying in our school actually were abandoning photography and becoming contemporary artists. Uh, not even using photography anymore, but switching to performance or sometimes even painting or sculpture, even if we didn't really uh, teach them that. Uh, so they felt some, somehow uh, complex of inferiority being uh, photographers. As we found out uh, in, uh, during our study with those students, basically every type of photograph they could have done could have been okay in, a, let's say, in an exhibition situation, uh, could have been a product of artistic activity, but required some sort of contextualization, explanation, and required some sort of special rhetorics to explain why actually they are doing that uh, and what does it all mean. And that was uh, the most difficult for, for them to grasp. Because at the very beginning, uh, young photographers were giving uh, a very naive uh, definition of what they are doing, actually, that we want, so why are you doing those photographs? We want to bring some beauty to people's homes or some happiness to their lives. So uh, something uh, young contemporary artists already knew that instead of that, they were actually expected to say, we want to question something, and we want to negate something, and we want to, so to, to challenge those uh, feeling of uh, safety, let's say, that audience have. So that sort of a questioning attitude, challenging attitude uh, towards, uh, towards the audience, that was something that contemporary artists immediately new, and young photographers only had to learn. So basically what they had to learn in the school, besides purely technical things, how to 
properly uh, print a photograph. Uh, that were those rhetorical skills. You know, so contemporary art, as to, to which we are all belong, to, we all belong, to some extent, actually, is that sort of explanation, that sort of rhetorics, which is based on the critical attitude, not just to life and capitalism and uh, the whole, uh, our whole, the global world in general, but in particular to the audience and its, uh, let's say, passive attitude. It's still coming from the avant-garde. This idea that the audience has to be mobilized and challenged uh, and uh, by the by the very artwork uh, still that practical conversation to which I return um, brings us to the fact that photography and contemporary art are very, very much together through the whole history of uh, those two media. media uh, they are uh, intermingled, they are entangled in uh, some sort of a conflict, but which is also uh, a very, very close uh, relationship. And contemporary art, as you know, referred to photography many, many times as it's some sort of a significant other. Something which has things contemporary art does not. And in the first place, there's some sort of a non-art attitude. So the first moment of that actually was already in 19th century, where those two media still existed in parallel. And photographers themselves, as you know, this so-called pictorialist photography was aiming at reproducing uh, pictorial technique. Um, pictorial effects, and at the same time, painters like Courbet were interested in this crude, direct, uh, and documentary attitude uh, of photography to reality. So that was already a moment of mutual influence. But then, of course, very strongly in the 20s, in the avant-garde uh, theory uh, of um, Russian productivists like Osip Brik or Walter Mayamin uh, or uh, Siegfried Krakauer, uh, we read a lot on uh, avant-garde as um, um, or photography, as Brick uh, puts it, uh, as a medium which is precise, fast, cheap, also more truth truthful than painting. So his point is that photography is much better than painting and will soon uh, replace it. Precise, fast, cheap, more truthful, more intellectual also, because photography at that moment was mostly black and white, so it was supposed to stimulate the imagination. Uh, more socially and politically engaged, of course, and in general, more anti-art. And so how we would describe now, that was a moment where photography was seen as a means of desacralization of artistic subjectivity. And many people whom we call we would call artists, like Alexander Rachenko, for instance, at that point did not call himself artist, but photographer. And for him, it was a very strong statement, so art is uh, dead. So from now on, he's a technician uh, who is really rejecting uh, that sort of a subjective imagination in favor for the truthful represent and political, what is very important, uh, representation of social reality. Another moment, the second moment, uh, when photography became very, very important was, of course, global conceptual movement and even pop a little bit before, uh, where photography became important with its post for this uh, touch, again, uh, non-human, in ideally a uh, way of um, dealing with science, immateriality of science, immateriality of the image, and this semiotical turn uh, where photography became the center of it, and this is why Fluxus used a lot of document, documentary um, documents, or in documenting in general with black and white photographs we immediately think about when we think of exhibitions of Fluxus or conceptual art. And today, uh, I would say photography in the recent years became totally different kind of photography now. The photography everybody is using on the cell phones, digital photography, constant image flow, and this is something which is very important uh, for what I would call the performativity of image production that becomes a center, central to uh, many um, artistic practices today. 
Uh, and two genres are coming together. One, uh, which I just mentioned, some documentation of performance, let's say photographs of uh, performances by Yves Klein or uh, Chris uh, Burden, which we typically could see at an exhibition. It is uh, somehow uh, changing in a paradoxical way and becoming a performance of uh, documentary photography. And this is the genre we all know under the name of lecture performance. So this is something I'm actually not doing now. I decided not to show images in order not to mix those genres together also because I have a feeling that nowadays this old good uh, you know, art history lecture medium, like showing images, is becoming an artistic medium. So this is what art is doing uh, by um, juxtaposing uh, the image flow. They are organizing in one or another way, and they comment to it, sometimes purely poetical, as Boris Andrejka is doing, an artist um, whom I know very well from Bratislava in Vienna, uh, or uh, other artists with whom I uh, worked, uh, and others you certainly know, like Hitter Steyr uh, and the others. So that sort of a performance that is using um, Image flow uh, is um, this never-ending display has this quality, quality of blog, of course, and this performativity of it uh, is becoming um, an important part of um, current, I would say that it's, uh, it's crucial the, in the current art, it's crucial the idea of display, which is constantly changing. Like, as every artist knows, and it, um, people have written about it, uh, Boris Groys is one of those who also wrote about it, uh, that the artwork, which is in, in possession of artists and an artist's atelier, is not really an artwork until it is performed, so to speak, in an exhibition. Even if it's a drawing, even if it's a painting, it has to be brought somewhere, it has to be put in some context, Context, and it has to be seen during the time of the exhibition, like now, for instance. Like now, uh, Sharana Shabazi's uh, photographs are being performed now as we speak, and then at six it will be over, and the performance will be over, and they kind of are switched off, yeah, so to speak, for the time of the night, and tomorrow at 10 the performance starts again. So sometimes it's uh, even literary, it can be a video, uh, but sometimes also so even static artworks are seen under the under the sign of um, being performed. And Boris Gross even wrote that every digital image is some sort of a performance of a uh, ur. Uh, image, yeah, so to speak, that exists uh, on a hard disk. So each time it can be printed, each time it can be shown, let's say, on a screen of your phone or of your computer, and each time it will be actually slightly different because of the quality of uh, this, um, you know, technical device. So it's also becoming, it's also um, acquiring the quality of uh, being performed. So this commented performative display, I would say it's the most typical art uh, form of um, our times. Anyway, in all those situations, or in many of those situations, photographs are being used. So what I want to say now is uh, how their contemporary um, existence of uh, photographs in contemporary art field is actually diverse and diversified. They're very, very different situations, and some of them are even contradictory. So I'll now present briefly this uh, contradictor contradictions that exist there. So photographs are being used, as I said, still with this idea of them being non-art. Art, contemporary art, still needs this injection of non-art. Uh, as many of you know, uh, 
something non-artsy, something more anonymous, something that has artistic subjectivity erased. And very often these are like found photographs, old photographs uh, that are included in one or another way in, let's say, a lecture performance or a research installation, another genre which is very typical for our times. We can imagine tables or wall uh, displays uh, where we're having lots of historical photographs found in internet, something very typical for our times. So photographs mark uh, this documentation purpose. And this is, um, I would say that even tells us something if you're coming to an exhibition and immediately see lots of photographs. So you immediately understand that this exhibition on this approach to art in general challenges this um, you know, traditional image making, traditional making of aesthetic objects in favor of documentation. So art instead of being understood as a production of beautiful objects for contemplation is rather understood in general art is documentation of something that already took place. Let's say an artistic activity of a group or a per performance that took place already, I don't know, decades ago. And what you are approaching uh, as a viewer is documentation of that. So uh, in the same way as um, it would be the difference between, a, let's say, a fictional novel and non-fictional book uh, that gives you something that is real, some documentation of something real. Uh, in that sense, photograph, black and white especially, old photographs, they are serving the means of contextualization. Uh, so that is uh, what is supposed to happen to, to the uh, viewer, to the audience, to be immersed in deep reflection on the context of one or another historical um, phenomenon, artistic or documentary or otherwise. Uh, and so photography works as this means of contextualization when, especially when there are many of them and there is a display of photography. On the on the other hand, and I promise that it will be contradictory, photograph isolated, a photograph taken out of this flow, a photograph, let's say, taken out of some blog or of some flow of images on Instagram is completely de deconstructualized, decontextualized, uh, and even becoming a decontextualizing force that uh, is erasing all sort of history in a way uh, and serves a uh, totally different purpose. And in that sense, um, you can imagine now uh, paintings by Marlene Dumas, who is famously using um, newspaper photographs. And by using them, by repainting them, she's actually strangely, in a paradoxical way, adding uh, layers of history to a totally isolated photograph. And so she's reintroducing them in this um, you know, discursive, reflexive context of contemporary art. So photography, unlike uh, people of the 20s actually thought, does not always guarantee the sort of intellectual and reflection stimulating quality. It's rather a display of photographs that can do that, but not a single photograph. And single photograph is actually very often works as a new sort of painting. Uh, whose role is actually to erase this historical flaw and to stop us in front of a beautiful painting and uh, rather to break this uh, you know, contextual smoothness. Uh, but what um, I would like to address in the last part of uh, my talk uh, would be uh, how we, uh, what is happening right now, what is happening today, and why we actually, in my impression, seeing uh, less of photography in, let's say, group exhibitions or big biennials. Um, although I'm speaking now in the context of a triennial of photography, still I would claim that in big exhibitions, and I'm coming yes, now right of, of a Berlin Biennial, like maybe some of you as well, um, it was clear that photography is used less in those contexts. And 
different. Why? What would be the reason for that? And I would say that this is not just an issue of um, personal taste or orientation, or aesthetical or uh, political or whatever exhibitions that can be, of course, very different. And of course, you can tell that you still see lots of photographs uh, in the last documentary, let's say, uh, but still. Um, Let's return to what I've said at the very beginning, uh, that photography uh, was representing some sort of a non-art in the context of contemporary art. It was, a, it was an instance uh, or a phenomenon, an important beacon, yes, so to speak, for the whole art uh, system to have something non-artistic, to have this uh, moment of self-negation, self-critique. And contemporary art is very much based on this non-art uh, rhetorics. And again, an anecdote from the life of my students, uh, students who were in, in, the, in the field of contemporary art, they knew this sort of rhetorics and they used it constantly so they, um, uh, of course, if they were given a task of, let's say, I don't know, to make a portrait of someone, they knew that they have to either represent uh, this person from, from the back or, I don't know, behind the curtain or something like that to, to totally erase this moment of portrait, portraiture, yes, so to speak, or something else. Of course, the ultimate avant-garde gesture would be just to have a black square or a black screen or any sort of nothingness which actually erasing the task which is somehow commissioned, so to speak, which is given to the artist either directly by, uh, by the patron or by the society in general. So this black square by Malevich is nothing else than just the refusal to give the audience, the viewer, something this viewer actually wanted to see. So this, is, this sort of attitude is at the core of contemporary art till now. Uh, and and every contemporary artist knows that, but the young photographers did not. And as soon as they were understanding that this is actually something they were supposed to do, to constantly kind of criticize this very field they are working in, they were totally lost. They were saying like, okay, but if it's all so bad, if contemporary art is something so bad that it should not uh, be pursued, why are we here at all? So they were not uh, really getting that sort of self-criticism as a rhetorical skill. Um, Anyway, so uh, what I want to say now is this non-art um, rhetorics is something which is being questioned now. It, I'm still waiting till it will be um, strongly, let's say, uh, theorized. It is not yet the case. Uh, these are like different tendencies and different questionings. But the main uh, problem is uh, that this old division between art and non-art put the things very unequally. So this is like a very, uh, you know, an epito epitome of uh, inequality when things are put on such a different levels as art and um, non art. And the whole avant-garde aesthetics is actually based uh, on this playing, thematizing, um, working with this inequality. And this inequality is in a very, very complex way influenced by social inequalities, of course. But the answer avant-garde artists were actually fine. Uh, the answer they found to those social inequalities uh, was uh, production of new elites. So as we know very well, so many of the theorists of the avant-garde of early 20th century, including, I don't know, Ortega y Gasset, or uh, people like Duchamp, or um, avant-garde artists like Malevich, they were actually putting it in a way that avant-garde is created for some new sort of a person. Like everybody is, of course, free to become this new sort of a person. It's not a closed club, but still it's something, some new sort of sensibility. The very notion of the new is very exclusive because, of course, when you're saying new, it means that there is also something old as soon as you say new. As soon as you say contemporary art in the context of, let's say, early 20th century, 
it immediately meant, and as soon as you say avant-garde, of course, it immediately means that there is also arrière guard. As soon as you say contemporary art, it also means that there are also other artists that did not, uh, let's say, uh, cannot get this um, right to be called themselves uh, contemporary. Like, uh, it's a con real life conversation from my work in Russian context uh, when some conservative um, art historians would say, why are you saying like contemporary art? And there are also artists who are painting icons now. Are they not contemporary, like in your understanding? So what to, what to answer to this question? It's a, of course all depends how you understand the word contemporary. Does it mean like absolutely everything which is happening today, or does it mean some values that are somehow that somehow entered art, and values artists pursue? In that sense, it would be like contemporary artists, those artists who really think of representing the very notion of contemporaneity. So that includes. Uh, or involves uh, a strong moment of exclusion. This whole system of avant-garde is based on that. Uh, and even aesthetically, as I reminded you, uh, early avant-garde works are all about uh, cutting or excluding an image uh, or excluding some uh, sort of like traditional crafts and traditional classical painting, let's say, Renaissance painting. The whole avant-garde is about like erasing those elements. And that sort of thinking for a century now uh, became and was became the, the core and the basis of avant-garde thinking, contemporary art thinking, was developed by uh, many um, generations of artists and still, uh, it is true if we say that it's like the whole modernism was also based on real exclusion. Not just on this rhetorical device of exclusion, uh, but also on real exclusion of uh, many artists and many contexts and uh, lots of artists of color, also many women artists. Uh, many, um, many phenomenons were not inscribed in this um, big canon of modernist or contemporary art, which is, uh, I don't know, represented in these enormous, enormous volumes of um, you know, history of 20th century art. And this is uh, uh, something which we are starting to understand gradually under the, under the pressure also of uh, people who felt excluded or representing those uh, parts of art uh, that was excluded. And it's gradually coming to us uh, since uh, already a couple of decades, but very strongly recently. And this is a very important and uh, totally revolutionary process that brings us artists we did not know before uh, and several like whole countries and whole traditions uh, that were not uh, part of um, art history. For instance, I'm returning to Berlin Biennale, which I just visited, and if um, um, some of you were there as well, so you definitely noticed that there were many artworks uh, with a very strong craft tradition involving lots of embroideries, uh, crafts in general that are normally excluded from this modernist art history, excluded also because in many countries it was a women's thing women's art, and this is something that returns to us through the work of um, contemporary artists or in some other exhibitions, not this one, in other exhibition, just the real thing, like not a contemporary artist kind of, you know, working with this traditional technique of embroidery, but real embroidery is done like now, today in Africa, becoming part uh, of the artistic display. And this is what is happening, and this is a great process, uh, which is changing a lot. It's such a revolutionary change. We um, not yet probably ready to understand what does it mean in order 
of um, you know reconsidering art history, really global art history, uh, where uh, this whole division between high art and crafts is becoming irrelevant, where this whole division, let's say, between innovative artist who is usually Western, of course, and till recently it was also usually a male artist, some in, in some innovator and uh, some others who were just following him. So this is how, in, in which terms the art history was actually described. And um, I know that many curators who are um, uh, concentrating their efforts, uh, let's say, in African art or art of Latin America, they're just refusing to use this category at all. They are saying that it's totally irrelevant and that should not be at all part, uh, part of the discourse. The very notion of innovation uh, is becoming compromised uh, by this logic of exclusion. Uh, that's an interesting moment of um, erasure of art history and change of it, and I'm not ready to tell you actually how it can, uh, how it can really change art history books and will it totally uh, change them, or will it will uh, totally destroy them, and what it will uh, be. But under those conditions, it's interesting and uh, also a bit sad to me to see that photography is something that disappears. So when uh, we are considering, let's say, crafts and um, um, Aboriginal traditions, of course they don't include photography, because photography is a universalist technical language, and as Chekhov once put, there is no such thing, such a thing as national table of multiplication. This is an international thing, and uh, it's uh, strange and difficult to talk about national tradition in photography, although some people trying to do that, but still, as you know very well, better than I do, then photography was also used as a colonizing tool. Photography was initially used in 19th century and long after that, and maybe till now, as a tool, tool of control. Uh, but among other things in the colonial situations. So photography was used uh, to identify um, colonial subjects. Uh, and in that sense, it was the instrument of the colonizer. Also, identify or uh, and or to exoticize them in some, um, you know, geographical albums that were produced slowly, but uh, always in those colonial contexts. Also included some white photographers that were coming and making photographs of uh, indigenous population. So let's say a great, we know some great African photographers like Malik Sidibe, for instance, but the, whose practice uh, demands explanation that he is actually appropriating the technique of the colonizer to use it as a resistance tool, and it's not easy to explain, and so that uh, photography is um, being identified as a over-national, international, and in that sense, as we know, uh, this word is being compromised as an instrument of the colonizer. So this is a tool that belongs to everybody. In, in that sense, it has no craft quality. It does, it does not have this authenticity of belonging to one particular ethnic or national context that other arts have. In that sense, photography is like communism. So after the end of communism, uh, every small nation uh, got the right of being nationalist because it was a legitimate uh, resistance to the, as it was put at the time in the 90s, to the unifying, um, uh, equalizing, and equalizing was seen, of course, in social sense as well, uh, equalizing influence of, let's say, Soviet Union as a communist country. So countries that freed themselves from this uh, left bloc equalizing 
um, influence, so they got the right to their small nationalisms. It started in Yugoslavia, and the result of this process is, as you know, that the bigger context set, and why not us then? Like, we also have the right to be nationalists. If they have, then why not alt-right? Uh, why not uh, IFD? Uh, we also have to have a right to be patriotic. So this normalization of um, nationalism, this is actually what happened. But uh, as I said, every, every um, identity in this context is um, getting the right to be specific, to have a specific tradition, to have a specific way of life, specific culture, except for this internationalist communist, because this is nowhere. Like, it's, it is, uh, as it is well known, the, the very country, uh, Soviet Union, so in the name of the country, there was neither geographical nor uh, national ethnic, actually, reference. So, so this was a... Uh, extremely universalist context. This is the only one uh, that is becoming problematic under those under those new view of things, where local localities uh, are getting the right to uh, have the have the pl a place uh, at the table, so to speak. So in that sense, in that sense, photography is a universalist language, is either being overlooked or being suspicious, as, as I said, the language of the colonizer. But this is one tendency, which is definitely there. And, but there is also another one, and um, I would maybe finish with that. Um, different tendency uh, I'm personally interested in, uh, where photography and all sort of um, you know, documentary fixation of reality, and here I will go beyond uh, photography towards also moving image or audio recordings, uh, all sort of uh, situations where these media, technical media, serve to uh, fixate the reality. We, of course, know that uh, we know about uh, possibility to fake every sort of recordings, and especially photographs. Uh, we know very well about very well about those uh, fake news, and in general, uh, of course, when we see a photograph, it uh, absolutely doesn't mean that there is some reality behind it. But still, there is some sort of a memory in us about times where there was a reality behind the photograph. So when we, when we saw a photograph, we could be sure that uh, it represents something, it represents something real that took place in the past. Uh, so photography is somewhere in this very interesting entanglement of uh, truth and fiction, which I would say, for me, it's the core of art in general. So this truth and fictionality are entangled in the photograph. But as I said, there is a new tendency which I would call investigative art, uh, where art uh, is um, deliberately self-instrumentalizing, yeah, so to speak. Deliberately and consciously putting itself uh, at their, um, inter interpreting uh, oneself, art, as an instrument of uh, um, getting to the truth. And I mean uh, works by um, forensic architecture people in this circle, but more and more I see artists also from different circles working with um, media material, which as I said might be photograph, might be also audio recording, might be video recording in order to get to the truth of reality and some with, uh, very often with some forensic, forensic um, uh, touch to it. When we, what we are talking about is a criminal story, very often a criminal story that has a very important you know, social uh, implications. 
it actually started earlier. We didn't identify this tendency, maybe. But when I'm reading a book of uh, Didi Überman uh, on Auschwitz, I see this is what is actually happening. So he's taking photographs there, and he's interpreting what he sees, but not just what he sees, but the photograph he made. So he maybe only sees those things he made on a photograph when, he's, when he looks at the photograph, not at the reality. And looking at those photographs of nature, actually, there, uh, he's starting to understand what was going on, and he, he, he looks at um, elements of those photographs as uh, proof. And here, you might remember one of the most famous, actually, lines of Walter Benjamin uh, text, where he says that Eugène old photographs of Paris are so impressive because everything on those photographs looks like, uh, like a proof of a crime. And why is he saying so? Because there is nothing criminal of the photograph. But the very concentration of our attention and very attempt of us to interpret this universal language immediately makes us go into history, which is represented there, and into possible you know, criminal aspect to it. And this is what is happening in um, works uh, you might have seen at the documenta. So the forensic architecture group uh, became very famous, although they exist uh, long ago, with this work. Uh, there are also other artists uh, working with that. At the Berlin Biennial, there was just a video that uses uh, same attempt. Uh, and um, I would say the lecture performances of artists who worked with some sort of interpretation of old photographs, they went in the same direction. You might uh, remember uh, some of the lecture, early lecture performances by Rabi Mrue, for instance, or Haikai Vazian, the artist with whom I worked recently, uh, where they really analyzing uh, photographs uh, as a document of um, uh, of reality, and very often there is a criminal story behind this reality. So this investigative turn, I would say, give us, um, again, um, uh, makes us invest in, uh, in this universal language of photography as the language of truth. So that might sound uh, very um, un, uh, old, uh, unmodern, uh, this notion of truth uh, in relation to art, but I think that this new take of investigative realism, yes, so to speak, with the, with the totally new technical and technological means, this is something uh, which might uh, give photography a new central place in the general field of contemporary art. Uh, otherwise, uh, this first tendency I was uh, describing now, uh, this inclusive um, art field, uh, which is it's very strong, and, it's, uh, uh, and that I would describe as a shift from contemporary art to art. In some way, this is something uh, where this uh, whole, you know, rhetorics of contemporary art as art, which is spe some specific part of art field, uh, which is somehow sharpened to understand the contemporaneity, and therefore it is being done by some special artists who are not like everybody, and who and it just happens that this whole rhetoric was applied to artists who were indeed white and often male. And so, although there was no direct correlation, but under current situation, so that is becoming too close. And so this is why uh, this contemporaneity might be changed into this inclusive field of art, where what we are rather seeing, I would say, uh, is a celebration of uh, some sort of universal creative force which exists in very different contexts. So this is an exhibition like uh, Berlin Biennial, which is just opened, I would say, this is what it shows us. Different, it's not about different contexts even, it's about different artistic subjectivities of a very various kind that indeed exists in different uh, places on our uh, global planet. But this is just one tendency. Another 
another one, this investigative angle I'm personally interested in, I think um, sharpens this contemporaneity uh, to, to the extreme, where indeed art is becoming uh, not just part of the society, but an instrument to really understand and by understanding really changing the society because we know that indeed in some cases uh, this art uh, investigation uh, became crucial in the investigation, the forensic investigation of uh, military crimes. So this is the field where art is um, you know, getting totally new possibilities. <laughs> 